Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's update on Hodgkin's lymphoma webinar. I am Jimena. I'll be the operator for today's call. Today's call, you will hear from an expert speaker who will have the opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box on the webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation on this program and gain certification of attendance. For listening via phone, this link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. Now, I'm pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of Patient Education at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you, and thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's update on Hodgkin Lymphoma webinar. Before I turn the program over to our speaker, I want to briefly share information with you on the Lymphoma Research Foundation. First off, we'd like to thank our sponsors of this webinar, Seattle Genetics and Merck. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we are thrilled to be able to bring you this educational program. LRF is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to lymphoma. Our mission is to eradicate this disease through investment in the most promising lymphoma research and to serve those impacted by lymphoma through quality education and support opportunities. As we continue to make progress in advancing lymphoma research, we also want to ensure that you have access to the latest information about your disease. The Foundation provides comprehensive disease and treatment-specific resources, programs, and services, all of which are offered free of charge and have been reviewed by lymphoma experts. Most relevant to today's call, LRF offers a variety of lymphoma-specific resources, many of which you can access at the bottom of your screen if you're utilizing the web link or via LRF's website, lymphoma.org, if you're on the phone. The LRF helpline can answer your specific questions about lymphoma, as well as discuss relevant treatment options and clinical trials. We also offer the Lymphoma Support Network, which is a one-to-one -one peer support program for people with lymphoma and their caregivers. We offer a variety of publications that have been reviewed by lymphoma experts to ensure you have access to the latest lymphoma information. Our mobile app, Focus on Lymphoma, is an award-winning app that provides patients and caregivers access to comprehensive content, as well as unique tools to help manage your disease. Finally, we have launched our COVID-19 Learning Center to support lymphoma patients and caregivers through this challenging time. Please visit our Learning Center for access to webinars, articles, and other resources specific to COVID-19. I really hope you take advantage of some of the great resources and services that LRF provides. If you have questions regarding what you heard about today, or if you need information about relevant treatment options and supportive care resources, you can reach out to LRF through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline at 1-800-500-9976. We have a wonderful program planned for you today, and I'm honored to introduce Dr. Craig Moskowitz. Dr. Moskowitz is the Physician-in-Chief of the Oncology Service Line at Sylvester Comprehensive Care Center under the University of Miami Health System. In addition, he is a professor of medicine at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. Thank you so much for speaking at our program today, Dr. Moskowitz. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've decided to um, gear this lecture towards um, um, answers to the most common consultation questions that I, I get. I'll try to do this fairly quickly um, and leave some time uh, for questions at the end. So these are, I think, the four most important questions. Um, are there any patients who are in remission after chemotherapy that require um, consolidated radiation? Is the addition of brentuximab to AVD now the standard treatment for patients with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma? When patients are not doing well, what is, what is the standard treatment strategy for patients with chronic Hodgkin lymphoma? And is there any hope for patients that need new treatments? So let's start with um, um, the role of radiotherapy. So radiotherapy tends to be given or not given in patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, back when I started training, back in the, uh, in the 90s, we gave a lot of radiation therapy after chemotherapy, and now, uh, 30 years later, we give very little radiation therapy. This may, the answer may fall somewhere in the middle. And I'll, I'll show you a series of, of studies that help answer that question. Um, this is a study um, from the German Hodgkin Lymphoma Study Group called the HD16. 
These are for the most favorable Hodgkin lymphoma patients, stage one or stage two, above the belly button. There was a randomized study just comparing two months of ABVD versus two months of AB, ABVD and radiation. And therapy was guided by, whether, by your PET scan after, uh, two dose, after the two months of chemotherapy. The bottom line is that when one gives only two cycles of chemotherapy, there is a significant improvement by the addition of radiation therapy at the end of treatment. So two cycles of chemotherapy with nothing else for early stage favorable Hodgkin lymphoma is not enough treatment. A study was published now five, six years ago, which we were involved with when I was at Sloan Kettering, um, which is called the RAPID study, which was three months of ABVD chemotherapy. And after that, a PET scan was done. If the PET scan had excellent results, which was seen in three quarters of the patients on the right side of this panel, there was a randomization to get radiation therapy or no further radiation therapy. At the end of the day, uh, if you look at the right curve, uh, right panel here, um, there was only a 4% improvement in the addition of radiation therapy to patients who received three cycles of chemotherapy and had a negative PET scan at the end of their treatment. So um, in general, um, in that situation, we do not recommend radiation therapy after three cycles of treatment. There was an interesting caveat to that study that if a patient had a single nodal mass of at least five centimeters, so I'm going to say about the size of a kiwi, um, even if the PET scan was negative after chemotherapy, there was an advantage to giving radiation. So when patients get three cycles of chemotherapy with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma and the PET scan is negative, if the largest lump is greater than five centimeters, the addition of radiation therapy is uh, clearly beneficial. We did a study um, with the uh, Alliance, which was four cycles of chemotherapy in early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. We gave two cycles of chemotherapy and did a PET scan. If the PET scan was negative, we gave two more cycles of chemotherapy and stopped. Um, and if the PET scan was positive, we changed treatment and gave radiotherapy. This was an interesting study. What happened was that nearly all the patients had a negative PET scan based upon a score called the Doville score. I'm not going to get into that today. We'll just say it's the way we analyze patients' PET scan results. Those patients with a favorable result, nearly 90%, more than 90% of the patients did well. And the few patients with an unfavorable result, only two-thirds of the patients did well. If one dives deeper into that on the right side of the panel, the very favorable patients, the um, um, best way to explain it is the patients who really have a perfect PET scan, um, we'll call that an A, um, they do extremely well. But patients who have an A- minus in their PET scan on the blue curve, only three quarters of the patients did well. So one could argue that if you fall onto the red curve, you don't need radiotherapy, and if you fall onto the blue curve, you may. There was a large study done by Andrea Gallanini from the Italian Lymphoma Study Group where patients had a very large mass in their chest. We'll just say it's about the size of a grapefruit. And the, role, and the plan was do patients who have a mass that size need to get radiation therapy after they receive full course chemotherapy, and we call that six cycles of chemotherapy. If we look at the right side of the panel here, patients got two months of chemotherapy and a PET scan was done, and the plan was four more months of chemotherapy. They did another PET scan, and the PET scan was done, it was negative again, then there was a randomization to receive radiation therapy or no radiation therapy in masses that were, uh, were greater than 10 centimeters. And at the end of the day, about 300 patients were randomly assigned to radiation therapy or no radiation therapy. And one can readily see that there's no difference in outcome. So in a patient who has a, a large mass of Hodgkin lymphoma stage one or stage two, who gets a PET scan for t uh, after two months, which is negative, and then another PET scan after four more months that are negative, the role of radiation therapy is um, not needed. So this is the data, um, uh, the way I see it, and the way I teach, and the way I practice. 
um, in the patients who receive only two cycles of chemotherapy, radiation therapy is essential. In patients who receive three cycles of chemotherapy, if the mass is greater than five centimeters, the physician and the patient should make a reasonable decision together if radiation therapy is needed. It is reasonable. The patients receiving four cycles of chemotherapy, if there is a fantastic pet result, radiation therapy is not needed. If it's an if it's a almost perfect result, then once again the patient and the and the doctor should decide together about the role of radiation therapy. If it's greater than five centimeters, I would consider giving it. And in patients who receive full course chemotherapy, as I just stated, with a normal PET scan in the middle and at the end of treatment, there's no role for radiation. Next thing I want to talk about is the this will be the large international random assignment trial that I wrote with John Radford. Um, we'll be opening in a number of centers in the United States. It's, the lead center is going to be in London, but this is a worldwide study for early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. Patients have stage one or stage two disease, and the question is, is the addition of brentuxin bevedotin, which we call um, in addition to AVD or AAVD, some people call it BVAVD, is that better than AVVD um, in early stage Hodgkin lymphoma? It's a very complicated slide here, but it's very similar. You get a PET scan. If the PET scan is negative, you get one more cycle of chemotherapy. If it's still negative, you're good. And this will be you know, the uh, what we like to call the registration trial for early-stage Hodgkin lymphoma for brentuxin bevedotin. If the brentuxin arm wins, then in all likelihood, all patients with early-stage Hodgkin lymphoma will receive BBABD, and ABBD will probably be um, undergoing a slow death. How do I treat early-stage disease? Well, I, I treat patients different from men and women. Um, I loathe radiating women um, for the obvious reasons of radiating the chest or the axilla can be associated with increased risk of breast cancer. So I rely on more chemotherapy for women. For men, I usually give the rapid paradigm, which is three cycles of chemotherapy. If the PET scan is negative, they're done. If it's positive, they got one more cycle in radiotherapy. For women, I use four cycles of chemotherapy. I rely more on, on, uh, on chemotherapy and no radiation. And for patients who have stage 2B disease, which is fever, night switch, or weight loss, we give everybody six months of chemotherapy. But we will enroll everybody on the radar study as soon as, uh, as it opens at the, the centers in the United States. Now, for advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, the question, which is not so much of a question anymore, but it's still important, um, is the addition of brentuximab to the AVD program superior to ABVD? This is the options that were available for the treatment of advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma uh, back about seven or eight years ago. It was six months of ABVD chemotherapy, six months of a program called escalated Biocop, which is commonly used in Europe. Um, the other studies were called pet adapted studies, which was you give ABVD for two cycles, if the PET scan is negative, you can um, drop the B, bleomycin, and, or you give escalated B a cop, but if the PET scan is negative, you cross over to ABVD. This is what has been done for years. I've been doing this type of approach from like 1992 to 2007 or eight. Um, and then we started, we've had some other studies, but certainly until about 2000. 15, I was doing this. Along came brentuximab and AVD, and we did a study called the Echelon 1, um, which was a study open both at Sloan Kettering and at the University of Miami. Those of you who know I left Sloan Kettering after being there for 25 and a half years to come down here to the University of Miami to run the cancer center, but I still see lymphoma patients um, a day and a half a week. Um, we did this study, which was we call BVAVD versus ABVD, for um, um, six months. It was a big randomized study. It's called the Echelon One. And um, those of you who don't know, ABVD was designed in 1974. So, um, as far as I know, that's 47 years ago, and it's probably time that we started doing some other things. And BVAVD was designed in 2012. This study was open in uh, 2015, so the results are now five years old. 
and the results are what they are. Um, there's a 7% improvement in the patients who receive BVAVD over ADVD. And for many practitioners in the United States, um, this has become standard of care for advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. It is a lot more expensive than ABVD. Um, however, it, um, the results are what they are. There's actually no difference in stage three or stage four disease, although um, not all stage three patients and not all stage four patients are the same. The conclusions of this study is that five years BVAVD is clearly superior to ABVD. It is not superior to the German program escalated Viacop, but is a lot less toxic. I haven't been giving escalated Viacop um, for over five or six years since this other program has been available. But if, you, if a practitioner is listening, if you still use that program, you probably can get away with giving only four cycles of treatment. So BVAVD falls somewhere in the middle between ABVD and escalated Viacop concerning cure rate and side effect profile. It's more toxic than ABVD, but better than ABVD and less toxic than escalated Viacop and minimally worse. So whenever everybody has to decide when they're treating patients, uh, where does the patient fall based upon risk? risk of not doing well or risk of being sick from treatment. There's going to be a national, there is a national study that has almost 600 patients on it, which is being led by Alex Herrera from the City of Hope. Um, we have about 20 patients on this trial at the University of Miami now, which is a randomized study of BVAVD, which we now think is the standard versus another program called AVD and nivolumab. And nivolumab is a checkpoint inhibitor. You can see there's no ABVD here, and I think that the leader, lymphoma leaders in the country, um, um, I am certainly um, agreed to this when this study was designed. I'm involved with this, with this study design um, that um, it probably makes no more sense to be studying ABVD in large groups. So this is a random assignment trial of nivolumab and AVD versus brentuximab and AVD. It's a thousand patient study, um, and hopefully this will be done in the next uh, year and a half, and we'll see if one of these two are better than the other. How do I treat advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma? Well, I enroll patients on the national study. Off protocol, I give brentuximab and AVD to stage 3B or 4 patients. And for the best early stage Hodgkin lymphoma patients who do not want to go on study, I still give ABVD. Now, when patients are not doing well um, with their Hodgkin lymphoma management, I can't discuss everything today, um, so I chose to discuss these four things. Um, these would be patients where a stem cell transplant failed or things are just not working out. I like to call this a situation where patients have chronic Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and uh, is there a standard treatment for chronic Hodgkin lymphoma? Well, there is a large study that was published um, a while back um, by John Caravella from the University of Toronto um, comparing uh, for patients who have had a lot of treatment. And you can see the eligibility here. Patients who never went into remission, patients who had a stem cell transplant and it didn't work, um, and patients were randomly assigned or a flip of a coin to receive brentuximab vidotin as a single agent or a checkpoint inhibitor pembrolizumab and to see which one was better for chronic uh, therapy. The well-balanced study, um, obviously the patients are young, um, more common to be male, um, more commonly uh, to be white, white Caucasians, everybody was in good shape. 40% uh, of the patients never went into remission. About 40% of the patients previously had radiotherapy. And uh, the results clearly show that pembrolizumab is superior to brentuximab vidotin for chronic treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma. Not only is it better as far as keeping the disease in check, it is far less toxic. And 
as many of the patients know, the major side effects with rentuximab is neuropathy. The major side effects with pembrolizumab is usually some types of inflammatory problems, but usually those are reversible. So in this particular setting, it makes the lymphoma shrink for a longer period of time and is less toxic, so pembrolizumab is the winner. I believe that um, there's probably no difference between pembrolizumab and nivolumab. They are cousins. If your doctor wants to give you nivolumab instead of pembrolizumab, that's fine. Um, I've been doing, I've done research on all three of these drugs for the last um, 11 years, and I will tell you I see no difference between pembrolizumab and nivolumab. And brentuximab is a totally different kettle of fish. Um, it behaves much more like chemotherapy as opposed to immunotherapy. But what happens if that doesn't work? The checkpoint inhibitors don't work. So that means ABV didn't work, and second-line treatments with a transplant didn't work, and the checkpoint inhibitors don't, uh, didn't work. Well, obviously, the answer is to send a patient along for a research study. Um, I think that the ones that are out there right now, uh, the ones that probably make the most sense is this one, this first drug, camilumumab, we like to call this cami. This is an antibody drug conjugate, just like brentuximab bedotin, but binds to a different uh, spoke on the wheel called CD25. Brentuximab bound to CD30. It's basically thinking of sort of like a syringe. The, the needle on the syringe binds to the lymphoma cell, and then the drug, which is inside the cylinder of the syringe, gets injected into the cell directly, and then it kills the cell based upon a, um, a certain mechanism of action. So we have to call this targeted killing. Now, this drug was given um, to patients, all the patients previously had brentuximab or nivolumab or pembrolizumab. And it turns out there was a very, it's a very active drug where um, 38 percent of the patients achieved a remission, and another 21 patients a partial response. And some of these patients have never relapsed, actually. So that sounds fine and dandy and great. The problem was that this drug has some side effects which are need to be worked out, and they're not easy side effects. They're real ones, which are associated with significant neurologic toxicity, which was seen. Um, 6% of the time, which to me is, you know, basically unacceptable. Um, this has to work out. You may or may, have, may or may not have heard this word called Guillain-Barre syndrome, but it's certainly, don't, it's certainly not something you want because um, it doesn't have to go away. So this needs to be sorted out. I think it will be eventually, but right now it's still evolving. The other possibility is uh, something called CAR T cells. Um, CAR T cells are approved right now for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the most common lymphoma, and it's been studied now fairly extensively at Baylor, um, um, where uh, Carlos Ramos has led this field. And what this is is, um, as a patient, you donate some um, blood. Um, that's then um, active, that those, uh, it's spun down, the T cells are then separated, they're then activated against a certain antigen on the lymphoma cell. And you'll remember in Hodgkin lymphoma, the thing that's on the cell that brentuximab binds to is called CD30. So these CAR T cells bind to CD30. And once they bind to CD30, they activate and could, could directly kill the cell. So there's been about 47 of our patients treated at Baylor and at the University of North Carolina. Everybody's had a ton of treatment before. Extremely well-tolerated treatment. Um, and um, the um, almost no side effects to speak of. And 
fairly shockingly, I just if we just concentrate um, after they got it right, um, if you look at the, uh, the third and the fourth column, the um, complete response rate was more than 50%. And the rule of thumb with CAR T cells in general, they check the results one month after you get it. And if you're not in remission, you will not go into remission. If you're in remission, and then you check again at 90 days, and if you're in remission, and if you check again at one year and you're in remission, it's extremely likely that you'll be cured, even though nothing else ever worked before. And now, and these lines are called swimmer's plots, like you're in a lane and you're swimming. And you can see that there are patients who are out still swimming down the lane at two years. So um, there's going to be now a, there is now a study, um, you know, industry partners have become involved, and now there is a CD30 CAR T cell, um, which a company has made, and there will be about 10 centers in the United States that will be doing these CAR T cells. We'll be doing it at the University of Miami as well, and that study should be open probably within a month. And lastly, people are always asking about allogeneic stem cell transplant, which means you're getting a transplant from a donor. In general, I'm not a fan of this. Um, historically, the results have been terrible and very toxic. But as we've learned more and more now, and the toxicity has come down, there's really only one rule about allogeneic stem cell transplant for Hodgkin lymphoma. is if you're not in remission at the time of an allogeneic stem cell transplant, the transplant will not convert you to being in remission. It can maintain the remission. So I never send patients for an allogeneic stem cell transplant who are not in remission. After, and remember, this is for patients who've had a ton of treatment before. We have to get lucky and get them into remission. And if we do, then I will send them for an allogeneic stem cell transplant. So what do I do in a patient who's done poorly after a whole bunch of different treatments? I do enroll the patients on clinical trials, and I, if one is not open, then I'll refer the patient for CAR T cells. My last slide, I know that these are gonna be questions and I'm happy to answer them in our question and answer period, is number one, what about if I'm in remission, how should I be monitored? The rule of thumb is we never monitor with PET scans. Um, in general, I do six month CAT scans. So CAT scans every six months for the first two years in early stage Hodgkin lymphoma and advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, I do six month CAT scans for the first two years and then one CAT scan at year three, and then we're done. If there's something wrong on a CAT scan, we can always do a PET scan. There are tons of survivorship programs out there, and I think that these are very important um, only because, in general, oncologists um, are not very good. At, long, at looking at um, the things that they have done to patients or things that the treatment has done to patients or what the disease has done to patients in the long run. And there are experts out there who take a look at the patient as a whole from top to bottom and try to make sure that things can be um, seen in appropriate time and appropriate prevent preventative measures can happen. People always ask me about fertility, especially with primary treatment, especially for women. Men, it's rather simple, obviously. Uh, um, I have never seen a woman unable to get have a baby from ABVD chemotherapy. I've had over 130 women in my career thus far uh, that have had children after ABVD chemotherapy, um, despite the fact the fact um, I. Let make this decision with my female patient, and we determine um, if she wants to have eggs harvested, it's fine with me. Um, the long-term side effects of treatment are very important. Um, they are, um, we always worry about um, secondary cancers in patients who have one cancer. Even if you've never had chemotherapy, it's always a little bit higher. Patients who have radiotherapy, we always worry about cancer in the radiation therapy field. 
We worry about, we're, we worry about coronary artery disease in the radiation therapy field. We worry about lung toxicity from bleomycin. Now, these are all rare or not common events, but we have to worry about them. People always ask me, like a mother asks me, you know, I have Hodgkin lymphoma, it's going to affect my children. The answer to that is no. There are twin studies that show a slightly increased incidence of Hodgkin lymphoma in twins, but that's about it. And then, of course, the real burning question is relapsing. And in general, Advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma relapses early, and early stage Hodgkin lymphoma relapses late. In general, if you have advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma and your disease doesn't come back for two years, the likelihood of it coming back is less than three or four percent. And, and almost all relapses happen within the first uh, six to nine months after treatment. For early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, where we get less treatment. Um, Relapse very early almost never happens. In patients, if patients relapse, they tend to relapse between 9 and 27 months post-treatment, or 24 months post-treatment. And after that, the likelihood is almost zero. So that's why we do scans during that period of time, and that's the window. Um, this is our group, University of Miami. Um, we have eight lymphoma physicians. I always like to thank the lymphoma service at Sloan Kettering, where I bled blue for 25 years. Um, and um, I'm always happy to um, answer any questions you might have about this lymphoma or any other lymphoma. Thanks for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Moskowitz. Um, like you said, we'll now begin our Q&A portion of the program. Just as a reminder, please keep your questions as general as possible so that the entire audience can benefit from their answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit your question through a Q&A box on your screen. We'll take as many as we can, but if you have a question that does not get answered, you can always reach out to our helpline at 800-500-9976. And our first question um, asks, have gone through ABVD followed by escalated BEA COPP for refractory disease. I then had AAVD following along with radiation. I recently learned of relapse and are going through ICE in preparation for an autologist stem cell transplant. Are there any other FDA-approved treatment options aside from a transplant, such as CAR-T? Um, so this is an unusual strategy for the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma. And um, it's very, you know, I'm just going, you know, it's hard for me to it's, I, I don't want to do a consult for you as we're doing this, um, but first I would say that an autotransplant has no role in your management unless you achieve a complete response. As you know, I wrote ICE chemotherapy in 1994, so um, the, um, we, ICE was never designed to be given after three different treatment programs. It was only designed to be given after one treatment program. So I would say that if you're in remission at that time, then sure, an autotransplant makes sense. Um, yes, there are many other treatment options. You've never had a, a, a checkpoint inhibitor, either Pembro or Nivolumab. So these are clearly options. If the ice doesn't put you into remission, then clearly you should be receiving pembrolizumab or nivolumab. Um, once again, I, I don't want to give you a consult here. I don't know you, but I would say that, um, um, you know, it might not be a terrible idea to seek out a lymphoma expert in your area where you live. Thank you, Dr. Moskowitz. Um, our next question, someone just asked you to talk a little more about the targeted therapies against CD20, like NLPHL? Well, NLPHL, as you know, is extremely rare. Only 400 cases each year in the United States. Um, I monitor everybody with LT Hodgkin lymphoma. I don't treat them. Rituximab, which binds CD20, is not curative. Um, the disease always comes back. Um, in patients with advanced stage LT Hodgkin lymphoma, I like to use rituximab combined with ABVD or rituximab combined with CHOP which is a non-Hodgkin lymphoma treatment. A single agent anti-CD20 drug does not cure patients with LP Hodgkin lymphoma. 
you. Um, our next question is, what is the radiation dose recommended for early favorable Hodgkin lymphoma after three um, regimens of ABVD? So in patients who get three cycles of ABVD and the PET scan is negative, so the, role, the question, first question is, should you get radiation therapy at all? Okay, because um, the research answer to that is it's not necessary. But if it is, uh, the mass was greater than five centimeters, and you and your doctor want to get, feel you want to get radiation therapy, the answer is 30 gray. Thank you. Our next question, I know this is more of a specific question, um, but if there's a way to answer uh, more generally, but this person says they're a 35-year-old male who had stage four Hodgkin's two years ago. They received ABVD for six months in radiation and they were in remission for a year and the cancer has come back in stage four. What type of treatment would you recommend or do you recommend just consulting with their practitioner? Well, if this isn't happening right now, um, I think that um, there are two programs that we recommend. Um, one um, was uh, published uh, by Alex Herrera uh, with a number of other folks, including myself, which is called Brentuximab, Adotin, and Nivolumab, or BV, uh, BV Nevo. Um, and usually that's given for four cycles followed by a stem cell transplant. We just published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology about six weeks ago um, Alice in Moscow, it's not related, but uh, I, I'm her mentor. Um, a study that we did at Sloan Kettering, I brought that down to Miami. It's a two-center study, which gave pembrolizumab and a program called gemcitabine, vinorelvine, and doxyl. Outstanding treatment. Also given for two to four cycles, followed by a stem cell transplant. There are research studies that are available as well that you might want to seek out. Thank you, Dr. Moskowitz. Um, the next question someone asked if there was any direct cause of Hodgkin lymphoma that was recently discovered apart from an EBV infection. But EBV does, does not cause Hodgkin lymphoma. It's just that EBV is, is EBV, um, what's the best way to explain it? The EBV genetic profile in about half of the patients with Hodgkin lymphoma can be seen. But EBV does not cause Hodgkin lymphoma. It may, be, it may hang out with Hodgkin lymphoma, but it's not causative. There's no known cause for Hodgkin lymphoma. Our next question is, can you please clarify what is considered early stage and what is late stage? This person is stage two Hodgkin lymphoma. The early stage, so I divide Hodgkin lymphoma into five buckets. Um, they're early stage favorable early stage unfavorable, early stage unfavorable with, with a large mass or tumor bulk, favorable advanced stage and unfavorable advanced stage disease. Favorable or early stage disease has to be stage one or two with perfect blood work and only one or two sites of disease. Once there are more than two sites of disease, even we call it unfavorable, it's not really unfavorable, it just means you need a little bit more treatment. And then of course there are patients who have bulky disease. So stage one or stage two is early stage. However, 85% of the time, the disease is from the belly button up. If you turn upside down, your disease is from the belly button down. Even if there's just one lymph node, that's always considered unfavorable early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. Thank you, Dr. Moskowitz. Um, Someone asked, would you treat stage one NLPHD different than traditional stage one HD due to the increased risk of transforming into a more aggressive form? Stage one disease should be radiated. After stage one disease, if it's not stage one disease, then um, if this person probably knows this, they must have that. We've already published recently that uh, we monitor all the patients pretty much until they need to be treated. But stage one, almost uniformly, worldwide, everybody radiates. Great, thank you. Um, I want to ask how you can find lymphoma experts that are in your area. You know, I think the, well, obviously the LRF can help you. Um, but also, um, 
almost almost all university a university hospital that has a medical school will have a lymphoma expert. The 130 okay, medical yes. schools in the United States, you've got to find a lymphoma expert in one of them. Yeah, that's uh, great advice. And also you can visit um, our website, lymphoma.org, and either go to our scientific advisory board or call our helpline directly, and we'd be happy um, to help you. But those are some great suggestions as well. Um, our next question is, um, once I'm considered cured, how long should I wait to try and get pregnant? Is it at least two years due to the follow-up scans? You know, pregnancy happens. <laughs> so, I mean, I would say that if you have early stage disease, I would probably wait a year. And advanced stage disease, probably two. That's the safest, that's probably a safe way to think about it. When I was younger, I was much more conservative and I made people wait longer, but the data just doesn't bear that out. Thank you. Um, so our next question said, asked, you mentioned 400 cases of NLPHL in the U.S. Is this 400 per year or 400 current active cases? Per year, per year. Can this, you give an update? Uh, classical lymphoma is ahead, about yeah. 86. Classical Hodgkin lymphoma is about 8,600 and 400 LP Hodgkin lymphoma. Thank you. Our next question is, can you give an update on CAR-T for Hodgkin's and if that is an option instead of allotransplant if someone has relapsed after immunotherapy? So, yeah, I mean, I did I did mention it in the talk, but I, I, I think that, um, once again, CAR-T cells are investigational and allotransplant is not investigational. Um, so you only can get CAR-T cells on a research study. And you have to seek that out. But I would say that the the world's expert on CAR T cells for Hodgkin lymphoma is Carlos Ramos at Bayer. He knows more about it than anybody else. Um, the same person asked, how long can you stay on immunotherapy, Pembro or Nevo? It depends. Um, I've given patients these treatments for, you know, um, five or six years, but if you really look at the data critically, um, most patients are on a year and a half, but there's a caveat to that. If a patient, and the, the way we, we did this on the pembrolizumab studies, and this is all published, uh, you could just look me up if you'd like, um, is we gave four or five doses and we did a PET scan. If the PET scan was negative, we gave four or five more doses. And if it was negative again, then we stopped. And there are patients who have never relapsed. Probably, you know, close to, you know, close to 20% patients have never relapsed. But if you don't achieve a complete response, then um, sooner or later the disease will grow. But we have patients in stable partial response for years. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that I loathe to stop the treatment if it's working but I'm very lenient on schedule, meaning it doesn't have to be given necessarily in a fixed period of time, like every four weeks. Sometimes we can spread it out a little bit, um, make sure that people go to all the life events they want to go to and whatnot. Um, there's no answer to your question, um, but once a checkpoint inhibitor doesn't work anymore, then unfortunately the life clock does start. Sooner or later there's going to be a problem. You. Our next question is, would using these single agent drugs like pembrolizumab in combination be more effective, especially if the person is young? We don't give single, it's not, I mean, it, we only give single agent treatment in patients who are getting chronic therapy and there's no evidence that it's better in younger than our older patients. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, the next one is, is the CAR-T cell therapy the doctor is speaking of work in the same manner as other CAR-T products that are on the market? Yes. And uh, one of 
our last questions we have here, unless we get another one in. This person asked, do target therapies that have been approved for Hodgkin lymphoma work for all subtypes, or are there specific subtypes they work better for? The targeted therapies are target CD30 or CD25, so they're only for classical Hodgkin lymphoma, not for LP Hodgkin lymphoma. Thank you. And just to end, we have a, a final comment someone uh, left in the question box that said, uh, thank you so much for your time explaining these important updates and fielding our questions. It has been such an informative session, and they truly appreciate your dedicated, a dedication to treating this disease. So we have um, one very satisfied listener. I'm sure that... This disease, I'm convinced this disease can be eradicated like polio. I am, I am, I'm not saying I am certain of it, but I am convinced that we can catch up to Hodgkin lymphoma. Thank you. There uh, that now, of course, I want to. Yeah, no, that's great. And of course, I said last question, and we have two more that just popped in. Um, uh, someone asked, "Would you talk about the recent evidence that shows Pembro or Nevo create a greater chemo sensitivity?" There's not evidence of that. There's only. Uh, there's only uh, anecdotal evidence. I actually believe it's true. I've seen, um, um, there's no doubt in my mind uh, in the Pembro GVD study that the addition of pembrolizumab doubled the complete response rate of the chemotherapy program. There's no doubt in my mind. So I do think that there is, um, you know, uh, some um, and I can't tell you biologically why this is happening, but I actually do believe that the combination of, of, the, of the chemotherapy and a checkpoint inhibitor are additive. And that's why we're doing the national study and adding the volumet to AVD to see if it's going to be superior to BVAVD. Thank you. And our so final we'll question is, are, the final question is, are there any new treatments for peripheral neuropathy? Um, I, I, you know, certainly wish there was. Um, you know, I have to tell you that I, I do all the appropriate things. I, I feel that, um, you know, uh, we don't make good headway with this. Um, um, I do try to. I, I think the most important thing with peripheral neuropathy is that in somebody with underlying. The big, um, this is a little bit more for, for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but it, uh, we can talk about it. In patients with underlying peripheral neuropathy, especially um, folks with diabetes, you probably should really be avoiding any of the treatments, any of the, of the drugs that we know that are going to cause peripheral neuropathy. I have a patient right now who is um, in his 60s with Hodgkin lymphoma easy Hodgkin lymphoma, stage one. But he has significant peripheral neuropathy from, um, from something I don't want to discuss. And um, so instead of giving him ABVD, I'm treating him like a non-Hodgkin lymphoma patient and giving him three other drugs. Now, granted, that's more toxic than ABVD. It's probably just as good, and it doesn't cause neuropathy. So I think the critical thing is if you know the patient is predisposed to getting neuropathy, then you need to think out of the box a little bit and try to avoid anything that could cause neuropathy. I think any person with a grade two neuropathy should see a neurologist. Thank you. And someone just had one final um, follow-up about the question about Pembro or Nevo. They asked if someone has progression on one of them, would you consider adding no, chemo no, no. or another agent? There's no value. You can add chemotherapy to the checkpoint inhibitor and see if that'll work. But just crossing over to the other one is not going to do anything. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Moskowitz. My pleasure. Um, this has been, Hope everybody yeah. is going to be okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks for your um, attention. We've got everybody. some great feedback. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone else for joining us on today's call. We hope you found the information both informative and also hopeful. We'd like to thank our sponsors again for making this program possible, Seattle Genetics and Merck. Please remember if you have any additional questions or you'd like to be connected with someone else who has been impacted by lymphoma, you can reach out to the LRF helpline at 800-500-9976.
Also, at the conclusion of this program, you'll receive an email prompting you to complete a program evaluation. I'd ask that you please take a few moments to complete this as they're very important for helping LRF to ensure that we deliver the most useful and meaningful programming to you. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and to have a wonderful day. Okay, bye-bye.